Okay, Chael. So, man on fire camp, Kevin Roberts. Yeah. You had a lot of good things to say about Coach Roberts. Uh, a college team of years yeah. at Oregon. Uh, guys are both All-Americans there, but what's it like coming? You don't do a ton of technique. You don't do a lot of, like, camps. Mm -hmm. But what's it like coming and working for Coach Roberts and Man yeah. on Fire? Camp? So I loved it. I had a great time. And you have to understand, it's a, a lot of it's about participation. You know, to, to be a coach and have some fun, you got to have some people show up. And uh, I was blown away. The place was packed. It turned people, I think he told me he had a, 130 kids. And we're only a week out of school here in Oregon. So it's some pretty driven kids. we got a lot of guys that are getting ready for Fargo. Uh, and then we just have a lot of guys that figured out where a good place to go to camp was. You know, I look at your technique, and you're always you're always growing as a technician. It's pretty incredible to me. You're 41 years old, and you're still out scrapping. First off, not old man tricks, by the way. A low right. single is not an old man yeah. trick. Thank you. But, you know, when I look at it, you're, you're always trying to get better with technique, and it's not necessarily MMA technique. It's it's wrestling technique. Are you a, a junkie with wrestling and yeah. technique? Yeah, so I I'm sitting here nodding my head yes to your compliment, but thank you. That's a really nice thing to say, but um, I do believe that in wrestling. I think, you know, you either evolve or you become extinct, and... Uh, a lot of it's because of flow, right? They came out with Technique Wave, and Kerry uh, Cola had a big thing to do with them, and then Ben Askren got involved with that, and all of a sudden, with the use of the internet, if you want to keep growing as a wrestler, it's only a couple clicks away. You just got to know where to look, and you can start getting some of this world-class technique. I was, I was online earlier today, Brandon Slay, Olympic champion, showing a gut wrench with, with some momentum, but the point that I'm trying to make is to just say what you're saying. You know, there's a new wave of wrestling. You don't have to be locked in the years when you wrestled. For me, the 90s, but the guys that coached me were the 70s and 80s. And uh, it, you're always trying to evolve with the use of the Internet, man. Take advantage of it. Looking at, you know, Coach Roberts, what was he for you as a role model? Yeah, so the thing with Coach Roberts is, you know, he was just dog tough. And coaches will always talk about that. You've either got a guy that sometimes has it or sometimes he doesn't. You can make both of them very good wrestlers. But those ones that just have that dog in them, that are willing to go that extra mile no matter what it means, it's you or me and I'm going to choose myself. Those kind of guys are the competitors. And that was just something that he had, you know. And it was something that I had to an extent, but there was also an extent of me that, that, that Envy didn't wish I had more of it. You know, you, uh, you look at guys like that that can go hard the whole time. They don't worry about injuries. They don't worry about making weight. They're never going to miss. They're going to show up and they're going to do your job. And he was one of those guys as a competitor. And I watched him, you know, whether it's at the University of Minnesota or what his junior college days or him doing it at Oregon State or even this camp here, he brings that to coaching. He's the first one to show up. He's the last one to leave. He's got good intensity the whole time. And uh, I think for most guys, that's a learned trade. I think, I think for him, that's just something that was that was instilled in him, and, and it comes through. But I, I find it very contagious. Do wrestlers dominate MMA, MMA, or does wrestling, the sport, dominate it? Yeah, so I'll say it the other way. I don't believe wrestling dominates MMA, but I do think wrestlers do. I think it's a mindset. I think when you go watch the sport of mixed martial arts, there's not a whole lot of wrestling techniques that are used. you got a double leg, you got a couple of scrambles, but that's where it ends. But it's that wrestler mindset that can go hard the whole time. You go for a position, I go for a position. You're going to grind for this, and I'm going to grind for that, and we're going to battle back and forth till time runs out. And that's one thing that, that wrestlers have. I think, I'll, t I'll share this with you, but I really think a, a upper hand that wrestlers have in life, they're not afraid to lose. We, we go out there, we get beat three or four times a month, let alone in a season. Let, you know, we're not worried about those things. Sometimes we don't see that in boxing. We certainly don't see that in MMA where guys are trying to preserve records, and it, it stops them. The, the fear of failure will stop a lot of guys. A wrestler will go through it anyway, and if he, if he scrapes his knee, he jumps right back up and he, and he recovers. I think that that's a lot because of the wrestling process. I mean, if you look at a tournament and a guy loses, he's up 45 minutes later in the wrestlebacks. So he doesn't have time to sit around and feel bad about him, uh, for himself. He doesn't have time to sit down with his coaches and decide who he's going to take on and what contracts he's going to sign. 45 minutes later, you're taking on another guy, and you never know who that's going to be. And I think there's something very compelling about that mindset that's that's unique to wrestlers. 18 to 22 weigh-ins a season. Yep. How does that prepare our guys for MMA? And how much of a joke is it when guys can't they, they miss weight in MMA? But you, you had to make weight in, in a given season, 18 to 22 times. You're an All-American sure. one year. So you had 22 weigh-ins that year, unless you missed duels. Yeah. But, but right? Like 18 to yeah. 22 weigh-ins. Yeah, so I, I've, been, I've never actually counted the weigh-ins, but by your example. It's about 18 to 22. Of the NCAA tournament, okay, that's three weigh-ins in a weekend. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. In an MMA year, an athlete will compete three times. So an NCAA athlete is going to weigh in three times in a weekend. A mixed martial arts athlete is going to weigh in three times in a year. To put some perspective around it for you. To put some perspective why when guys miss weight, a lot of us wrestlers 
take that as an insult. We take that as a sign of weakness. We speak out against it. In our world, that's a tremendously big deal. And also in our world, if you don't make weight, you don't compete. It's black and white. There is no, I was two tenths over, I was one pound over, or if I would have had an hour, you make it or you don't. And there's no looking back. In mixed martial arts, it is a little bit different. It, uh, you know, you decide if that's good or bad, but it is a difference. You can miss weight, and then they, they figure it out, and they redo a contract real fast, and the show goes on. And in our sport, the show doesn't go on. You don't, you don't weigh in, you don't wrestle. You don't weigh in, you don't wrestle. If okay. you don't make weight, you don't wrestle. Okay. We're, it's like super modest, too. Like, our sport's super modest, and you guys are promoting a fist fight. And I hear you talk about it all the time. Sure. Why did wrestlers so, why are we so, oh... We don't want to step over the line. Why? Why is wrestler? Why is? Why are we like that? Why do we spite ourselves for promotion? Yeah, million dollar question, right? And we, we talk about it all the time. And I can tell you, as a wrestling coach, even though as a as a professional, I like something different. But as a coach, I preach: you shake hands, you put your head down, you walk away. If I'm coaching a young man and he throws his headgear, and that's like the ultimate temper tantrum in wrestling, is to take the headgear off and throw it. Oh my goodness, I'll lose it. Can't do that. But once you once you get into the professional sports it does turn a little bit different where you need to bring some eyes on you. And I don't, I don't, I don't suggest being a poor sport. I, I don't suggest that at all, but I do suggest uh, being vocal. I do suggest if you've got a hope or a goal or a dream or something you think you can achieve to go ahead and put yourself out there. You know, I still remember uh, 2008 when Ben Askren was going to put the chin in China. And, you know, it was one of the greatest marketings in, in wrestling. And, and here it was 10 years ago, but it was a guy that was convinced he was going to be an Olympic champion and wasn't afraid to suffer the embarrassment of people telling him, no, you can't, or should you not, we're all going to tease you. He wasn't, he wasn't afraid of those things. He, he was willing to be like Babe Ruth. He was willing to walk to the mound and say where I was going to put the ball. And whether it worked out or it didn't, he had the courage to do it. And I just think that it's a really good lesson for wrestlers. I don't know if I really gave you the answer, but I think the answer is somewhere within my response. Will your kids wrestle? You have a couple kids, right? Yeah. Will they wrestle? So I have a little girl, and uh, no, she will not. I have a little boy who's three years old, and he won't wrestle until he's about nine years old competitively. But uh, we wrestle every night. We talk about it every night. We watch the videos every night. But... That's more my vision than his, right? He says he wants to be a wrestler. Because he knows that's what dad wants. Uh, he won't be pushed into wrestling, but he will be encouraged. Once he finds whatever sport it is he likes, he'll, he'll be encouraged to pursue it. And I, and I will tell you this, but it comes from one of our own wrestlers, Lincoln McElravey. Great wrestler, very successful. And he recently did an interview, and he talked about, this was his philosophy, but I, I'm, I'm going to adopt it. I really liked it. And he said, you are not your kid's coach. You are your kid's teammate. The relevance there is a coach will say certain things to an athlete, but a teammate won't. There's ways you would talk to an teammate. What he's talking about is encouragement. A teammate doesn't, doesn't grab another guy and, and, and shake him up sometimes when he needs He just encourages him. And Mac Ravy was his point was that uh, you know, you're, you're your kid's teammate, and, and largely you're just their chauffeur. You find out what they want to do, and then you get them there. And where they go with that drive and passion is up to them, but let, let, let them choose the activity. I will tell you my kids will be involved in activities. I hate for young people, I hate free time. I don't think a young person should have free time. So I don't take any shame in telling you that they will do something, but I'll let them choose what that is. Giving back, why do you have to, you didn't have to come here today. You don't do a lot of wrestling clinics. Why, does, why is giving back and why do wrestlers, why are we like that? I don't fully agree with you. So I was coached by uh, two men when I was growing up, Roy Pittman and Dave Sandville. Now these were just the guys in my hometown. Coach Pittman ran the club that was near my house, and, and Coach Sandville was uh, the coach of the high school that my parent, the house I lived in was going to feed into. I didn't appreciate that. I do now. I didn't appreciate it, but I didn't know anything. I was nine years old when I met these guys, and they were just a coach. Both of these guys are now in the Hall of Fame. Both of these guys are, are some of the most legendary coaches in the country, and this is what I had growing up. I never gave those guys a dollar. I never even gave them a thank you, and it wasn't because I didn't appreciate them. It's just I, I didn't know how to say thank you. It wasn't enough. I didn't know how to do it. So I had to become a grown man. I was almost 30 years old. I took each one. I took Coach Pittman to lunch. I took Coach Sample to breakfast and told them, thank you. All they asked of me, you just give back. You take what we gave you and you give it to somebody else and the slate's clean. So you say I don't have to be here. In, in many ways, I do. What's next? Going to Bristol, Connecticut. Where, where are you next? Where do you fight? What are you doing? Yeah, so uh, for me, let's see. I got practice tonight back in Portland, so I'm going <laughs> to jump in my car and, and go back there. But uh, competitively, I'll be fighting again in October. I'm going to fight with a guy named uh, Fedor, Russian fighter. And that's a semifinal of a tournament we're in. The winner will fight for world championship. You're going to fight Fedor? Fedor Milianenko. That surprises I, me. I love heard. that you... 
that really just, actually surprised me. You acted like... <laughs> Why? What surprised you about that? Well, Either, I just, I didn't well, know. He was the greatest guy on the planet was at one he? point in time. Is that true? Yeah, I don't, you don't seem to care. Where was I? Like I? Where, I'm just wondering where I was. People tell me that all the time, Fader was the great. Where was I? Where you were the I greatest draw on the planet. Goddamn right I was. I know that. Goddamn right I was I at was. UFC 117. Huh? Sold out. Did, did you know that? Crowd? At the Oracle? I believe I did because I think you told me that. Yeah, I was at the Oracle. I appreciate that. And you should have won the fight. I appreciate that. Well, Could I, I give a shout out to our world team? Yeah, oh, let's go. Let's hear it. Go. Yeah, that's it, man. I just want I want to thank those guys. I want to thank everybody that did their part. There were there were some historic matches. I love what Adam Coon's doing. Uh, I don't know if Bill Zadick and Matt Lennon, I think they have their own opinions. I think they like when a guy chooses a style. I won't argue with them. I'll just tell you, I'm not a coach. I'm a fan on that level. The fan in me, I think that's an Iron Man right there. I think it was a terrific example. I wish more guys would do it. I think that Hayes Winkle showed us. I think that Coon has shown us. I think that there's really something... Uh, special there. We Rick still Sanders got... did that. Rick One Sanders. In, in yeah, and you know, guys used to do that. Dave Schultz doesn't get the credit, but Dave Schultz used to go bull styles. Larry Owens, who's famous for beating Dan Gable, he was actually a U.S. Uh, Open Greco Roman champion. That used to be very common, and somewhere in the very early 90s, they decided you had to pick one. And, um, again, I think our leadership gets to make that call, not me. But I'm not in leadership. I'm a fan. And the fan in me is very grateful to those guys. All of them. All the way to Tony Ramos gets a big shout-out for me. You know, a guy that, that, that had all sorts of drama and all, you know, switched weight classes and switched colleges and had all these. That weight class is as tough as it is because of guys like, like Tony Ramos. Just by one example. But for me as a fan, it means something. You got anything else for me? I talk wrestling all day, man. You don't want to do that with me. You run out of camera. All right, you got.